Welcome everyone. Before we get started, we want to let you know that the Resiliency Center has staff members and service animals in the chambers and outside of the chambers for those of you that need uh, are in need of this service today. On behalf of the committee, we'd like to thank the Vegas Strong Resiliency Center. The Resiliency Center is a place of healing and support dedicated to serving as a multi-agency resource and referral center for residents, visitors, and responders affected by the shooting at the, nine, uh, at the Route 91 Harvest Festival. Now I call the 1 October Memorial Committee meeting to order on October 28, 2020 at 9.02 a.m. Uh, all committee members are present. Now all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, you may be seated. Dan Hernandez. Good morning uh, to our uh, committee members and general public. Uh, I am Dan Hernandez. I am the Parks and Recreation Director for Clark County. At this time, I would like to introduce uh, Commissioner Jim Gibson, who is here with us today, to make a few comments on behalf of the Board of County Commissioners. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. And first, I want to thank you for your willingness to serve as members of this important committee. We appreciate the dedication of the time you've given up to this point and the time you'll give going forward and for undertaking this important piece of the fabric of this community because that in very deed is what is going to happen over time as uh, this thread weaves itself in and through our community to reflect the things that are really important. Now, the work ahead will not be easy. We continue to grieve the outcomes, the events of 1 October, and discussions are certain to be emotional at times. But we have emotional dis uh, conversations when we're on the county commission, uh, but they will bear no semblance at all to the conversations that may evoke emotions among you and those who will participate. The County Commission's goal in establishing this committee and in creating a memorial is to remember those who lost their lives, those who were injured, the families of all of them, the, those who survived uh, but were marked by the events, the first responders who risked their lives to provide life, help, and to celebrate the remarkable community we showed ourselves to be in the aftermath of this unspeakable violence. We're starting with a blank slate in terms of what a memorial will be, where it will be situated, how it will be funded, the design, the construction, and the upkeep. All of these questions and others that will come up will be topics for consideration as you meet and gather input to develop your recommendations. We know the process of creating a memorial will take time. And uh, we, we recognize that the 9-11 the, uh, memorial and museum opened 10 years after the 9-11 attacks. Our hope is that it isn't as prolonged as that. There's a lot of pent up anxiety as you all know. And along with that comes some frustration. So we know you'll work apace and that you'll work through it in the right way. Public input is a critical part of the work that you'll do. As we consider what a memorial should be, it'll be important for your recommendations to reflect the collective input of all those affected by 1 October. Family members who lost loved ones, survivors and their family members, responders and bystanders uh, who rendered aid. And we all also uh, recognize how important it is to reflect on the goodness 
we saw in the, in the immediate aftermath. The way the community rallied to love and support the victim, victims as well as each other. Now, the memorial that comes from this process will need to be inclusive. It will validate the experiences and the emotions that are evoked whenever we think of it. If you live outside this community, we welcome you and invite you to participate as well. Committee meetings will be broadcast locally on Clark County TV. They'll be carried live on the county's YouTube channel and the committee's Facebook page at One October Memorial. And I think it's important to note that there has been a tremendous amount of preparation as we've worked to get ready to do this. The only way it will work is by having this incredible Parks and Rec staff uh, supporting you and all of the rest of the departments as required at Clark County in order that you might have the resources available to you to make certain that everything you hear and you do is something that is seen, felt, and experienced by the people in this community. If you miss a meeting uh, and, and, and you're not able to either attend here or watch when it's broadcast, um, you can watch the recording on YouTube and the committee's website pages, clarkcountynv.gov slash one October memorial. And people can also offer input by email uh, and in survey opportunities that will be conducted as a part of your outreach as you determine to do it. This endeavor is worth our time and our effort and the, the expenditure of the resources, whether it is human resource or otherwise. We're, we pledge to provide all of that as required. Know that my fellow commissioners and I support your work, support you, and are every bit as desirous of an outcome that is reflective of all that Southern Nevada has at its hand, in its mind, and in its heart as you work to that end. We know this process will be a journey. And we're certain your work will lead to something that serves as a fitting tribute and reminder, an opportunity and cause to remember the events of 1 October and something that we can take pride in as a community. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your service. Thank you, Commissioner Gibson. Now closing agenda item number one and opening item number two. Any wish, any, anyone wishing to give public comment on the agenda items for today's meeting only, please come up to the front of the podium. Comments will be limited to three minutes. Please state your name, address, and the agenda item that you are referring to. Additionally, committee, please note staff did not receive public comment on the agenda prior to 3 p.m. of yesterday. Just ask me if I can't, I can't hear you. Is your comment for uh, the agenda item, for one of the agenda items? Uh-huh. Okay, which item? 7, 8, 9, and 10. All right, perfect. Come on up here. Is this the mic or is that the mic? That's the mic and it is on. Okay. My name is Glenn Hunsucker. I live in Las Vegas. I will not give you my exact address because this is publicized to the thousands of people and I don't want to <laughs> give everyone my address. Glenn Hunsucker, G-L-E-N-N-H-U-N-S-U-C-K-E-R. Okay. I recommend that whoever is selected as chairman look into the possible causes for the biggest mass murder in American history. There is no official cause listed, but after 20 years of research uh, on the casino industry, I suggest that consumer fraud committed by the casinos be, be examined as a contributing factor, if not the major cause. There are millions of mentally unstable people walking the streets, but they do not go out and murder innocent people. This happened here in Las Vegas. 
by a mentally unstable high roller who lost most of his money at the casino's unfair casino games. What would have happened if he had known the games were unfair? We will never know the answers to that question. The gaming regulations make it easy for casinos to commit consumer fraud, specifically 14.110 calls it modification, not rigging the games, it's a modification of a gaming device. Example, they use roulette balls at different sizes and weights at, at the same table. If you don't believe me, just go ask any casino. Also, their so-called shuffling machines have over 500 different settings. Each setting arranges the cards in a different sequence. Arranging cards changes the odds and statistics of winning or losing, but the consumer is not told about it. This is consumer fraud, quite clearly. Everyone is supposed to be equal under the law, including the casinos. No business is allowed to commit consumer fraud, and the casinos should be exactly the same. The families of those lost on that October day deserve to know if consumer fraud played a part in this. Because if we don't figure out the cause, and if it is consumer fraud is a part of it, then it can happen again, right here in Las Vegas. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and for being here today. Okay, seeing no other additional public comments, we move to open agenda item number three, approval of the agenda for possible action. Um, at this point, I would like for the committee to remove item number five, as we have already done that in item number one. And we are seeking a motion. I would move to accept the agenda for today. Perfect. And all in favor? Oh, I, second. I second that motion. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. OK. Uh, now we'll be opening agenda item number four, minutes for the workshops in June, July, August, and September for possible actions. Those committee members uh, would be under your meeting minutes current tab. Again, for procedure, I would move for approval. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Madam Secretary, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Puna Mather. I have the honor of serving as your head cheerleader, um, also known as a consultant to the committee. Um, so th those of you that are safely in the room with us, welcome. To those of you who are choosing to safely participate and listen from home, welcome. Um, and I can't tell you how excited all of these committee members are. Uh, they have spent four workshops, four hours at a time, 16 hours we have spent, it felt like sitting in a driveway or sitting in the garage, right? Ready to go on the journey, as Commissioner Gibson so eloquently described it. And so here we are today rolling out of the, we're rolling into the driveway. We're gonna begin the journey. Um, for those of us that are listening, I've had the, and I and the Parks and Rec staff have had the gift of um, spending time with these seven committee members. 
not every one of you know them all. Many of you know some of them. So we're just going to start with some introductions, because as we create the kind of strong relationships with the authenticity that will be required to go successfully through this journey on the terms that Commissioner Gibson described it, relationships really matter. And so it's super important to get to know one another. So here's what I'm going to do. Let me tell you just a snippet. You can find some bio information about them all on the One October Memorial website. But starting in alpha order, left to right, I'm going to introduce you quickly. I'm going to then toss three questions for you to answer that you've never heard before. So this is how we did it. This is how we get vulnerable, and we kind of show up for real. So um, to your immediate left is Harold Bradford. He is a local artist, a longtime resident, used to play football, and has had all kinds of really extraordinary life experience that he brings with him into this moment and this journey. Here are the three questions, starting with you, sir. In one word, one word, I know it's going to be hard, one word that best describes your feeling about serving on this committee. Second question, in one sentence, what is your personal promise to the community as you lead us through this process? Another way to ask you that is, what can our community count on from you? One sentence. Third question, share a fun fact about you. Some fun fact that even those of us that have spent 16 hours with you would not know. And I'll give you an example. Here's a fun fact about me. I love jigsaw puzzles. No one knew that, did you? I know, I love jigsaw puzzles. I love sushi. A couple of fun facts. So those are the three questions. In one word, what is your feeling about serving on this committee? Second, in one sentence, what's your personal promise to the community as you lead us through? What can we count on, all of us, from you? And third, one fun fact that people don't know. Mr. Bradford. First question, uh, exuberance. Exuberance, thank yes. you. In one sentence, what's your personal promise? What's your pinky promise to this community, sir? My pinky promise is to, um, just to ensure and uh, try to help ensure that uh, the people uh, of the community that has been affected by what happened uh, one October, that uh, we'll do the best. I'll do 110%, uh, if not more, to, and, and hopes that uh, we could come to uh, some kind of closure, or just just uh, a, mem a memory, uh, a memorial, uh, acknowledgement of the people that uh, was affected by the whole event. And I am uh, just honored to be a part of this committee and uh, hope that we can together get it all done. Beautiful. Exuberant, right? Yes. Love that word. And what, one fun fact, please. Uh, I guess uh, one fun fact is uh, the fact that uh, just I, I, it's hard to kind of think of just one thing, but I have a, a, as, as the committee knows, amongst in a, during our meetings, I've had uh, several different things, and I guess that I'm just a fun-loving person, I guess. And that, uh, that is a fun that's, fact. That's, that's <laughs> the number. I guess the number one thing, and I, I'll try to find uh, something positive in pretty much everything. I, I look to the, the positive side, so. It's beautiful. Welcome, Mr. Bradford. Um, honored to have you lead us through Thank this you. journey. Um, next up, next to him is, is uh, oh, you moved, Re Rebecca Holden. I had, never mind, I thought it was alphabetical. I will, you tried to throw me off, but I didn't get so thrown off. Rebecca Holden is next, a visual arts specialist for the city of Las Vegas and also serves as chair of the Clark County, of Clark County Public Art Committee. Um, so, Rebecca. Three questions. One word that best describes your feeling about serving on this committee. Two in one sentence. What's your personal promise to all of us as you lead us through the process? And third, one fun fact, please. Thank you very much. Always, always with the good questions. Um, the first, I guess the best word I can use to describe today is the magnitude of today and the events um, of us gathering together to make this happen 
My promise to the community is that this will be a very thoughtful approach that we responsibly handle through um, active participation and response to the community. And a fun fact about me, um, while I manage a lot of public art projects, I myself am an artist. I really enjoy um, oil painting. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your service and for leading us through this process. Dr. Robert Fielden is up next. Um, kind of an iconic fellow, renowned architect, longtime resident, deep commitment to community that shows up in lots of different ways. So Dr. Fielden, welcome to the journey. And three questions, one word. How are you feeling about the role? Two, what's your promise to the community? And third, what's a fun fact, please? Press your button. First is honor. I'm honored to serve as a member of this committee. Um, in terms of the second, I think um, what I promise to bring to this committee is, uh, and its work, is diligence, and transparency, and uh, using it as the means to elevate uh, humanity and quality of life. Mm, beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Fielding. Oh, and I love to smoke barbecue. Oh, <laughs> you love to smoke barbecue or? No, I smoke it. Smo yeah. Not like this way, but no. like no, on a barbecue. That's, that's exactly Good. Right. We were a little worried. Just for a second. Only for a second. Yeah. That's I, an important uh, clarification. And I compete often oh. as well. I do, maybe as part of this journey, at some point there will be a barbecue in someone's backyard, of even course. if we have to be six foot separate. Yep, the crowd likes that idea. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Field, and well done. welcome to the journey. Mm -hmm. um, next up, Tanil Pereira. Tanil um, has, uh, barely looks old enough, but has given a career in service to the nation already. Um, she is a good attorney which sometimes aren't two words that I use in the same sentence, but in Tanil's case, she's a good attorney, works at Legal Aid, and most recently responded to the call to be the director of the Vegas Strong Resiliency Center, which was created by her employer, the Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada. Tanil, um, what's the one word that best describes your feeling about serving on this committee? In one sentence, second, what's your personal promise? What can we count on from you? And one fun fact, please. So my word is humble. humble. I feel very humble to be up here today and to um, be part of this committee and working alongside so many amazing people. Um, I promise to set myself to the side and listen hmm. and truly hear um, what everyone wants to share, their experiences, and do my utmost to incorporate um, that into any decisions that we make um, and validate those experiences. Uh, fun fact about me, um, mm -hmm. probably nobody in this room knows this, in my previous uh, career with the Navy, I actually was selected to be on the Navy wrestling team <laughs> and I wrestled full time um, for a period of time before 9-11 happened, so fun fact. <laughs> wow, hmm. wow. By the way, she also has six children, correct? Correct, six yep. children. Six children, so that's you wrestling now. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Welcome to the journey, and we appreciate your leadership and your service. Carissa Royce. Um, Carissa, she survived a critical gunshot wound on 1 October 2017 uh, and is now deeply committed to helping our community heal, which we all know also helps her in her journey to heal. Uh, she brings vigor and perspective and youth and energy. Um, really honored to have you as a leader. So three questions in one word. What does it mean to you to serve on the committee in one sentence? What's your personal promise to the community? And third, what's a fun fact? A word I can describe um, is gratitude. I'm thankful to be alive today and I'm honored to be serving on this committee um, and serving the public um, in this capacity. Um, you all can count on me to show up um, vulnerably at every meeting and throughout this whole process. 
I recognize that this is um, incredibly personal for so many of us, and no matter how hard this journey gets, I'm committed to, to staying present um, and being as vulnerable as I can throughout this process. A fun fact about me is that um, through quarantine, I have become the master baker. Um, I bake <coughs> cookies for my family probably three to four times a week now, and it's something I um, really take joy in, and it's the best form of relaxation after work for me. So <laughs> thank you, everybody. That's awesome. Okay, so here's what's now emerging for me is a barbecue in a backyard punctuated by some world-class baking. Let's hope so. Welcome to the moment, welcome to the role, and thank you for your service and leadership. Um, next up, Minda Smith. Minda, Minda, Minda. Um, she could be an octopus for as many ways in which she is touching and making the world a better place. Um, Minda's sister, Naisha, Nisha, was among the 58 lives lost on 1 <laughs> October, and every day since then, she has sought and found some light by helping other families. Um, so Minda, welcome to the moment. Welcome to the leadership role. In one word, what does it mean to serve on the committee? In one sentence, what's your pledge uh, and promise to the community? And third, what's a fun fact? Okay, thank you, Poonam. Um, the, the bad part about going last is I feel like all my words have been taken, so I'm just going to reiterate um, how grateful I am to be here and how honored I am to be in this position. Um, the promise that I will make is to not cry, <laughs> so excuse me. Um. That's not even a rule, so you don't have to keep that promise. It's not even yeah, a good. rule. Yeah, I can't keep that promise You're for sure. I'll break that promise. <laughs> um, but I do promise to remember and honor those who were lost, those who lived October 1, and all of those who were impacted in some way or another, and to constantly keep an open mind through this process with um, an open heart as well. Um, fun fact for me is um, I deeply love my family. And one of the joys that comes with that is when we travel and we are maybe 60 feet underwater exploring the ocean. So I do love to scuba dive. Um, welcome to the moment. Welcome to the leadership role. Um, and thank you for your service. And the part of the family that she loves so much is sitting right behind us because they got here early so they could get front row, which is sort of how the Smith crew works. Uh, welcome, Smith. Um, and then finally, last but not least, it's just an alphabetical reality, Andrew Walsh. Andrew um, is deputy chief with Metro and was forever made a different human being by being one of the brave first responders on the scene at 1 October and that tragedy. So, Andrew, welcome. Um, and three questions for you, sir. What's one word that best describes your feeling about serving on this committee? One sentence, what's your personal promise to the community? And what's a fun fact? Well, the one word that comes to mind was already used, but I have to use it anyway. Uh, humility. Um, it's, it's with a great sense of humility to, that I f feel a part of being a part of this committee. Uh, a sentence, you know, one way to describe is that I would just say that, you know, I promise to be a part of uh, this team that listens to each other and listens to the community in our hopes to get this as close to 100% perfect and right as we can. Um, and in a fun fact, uh, I played about 20 games of Mario Kart 8 yesterday with my 11-year-old daughter because I took the day off because it was our wedding anniversary and I lost every one of those games. <laughs> and I'd be embarrassed to tell you that as an 11-year-old, she's very enterprising. She realized that we could bet on the games. and I continued to lose and lose and lose. So um, I owe an 11-year-old some money because I can't win a video game. <laughs> Not all Metro guys are super tough, huh? Um, that's lovely. Welcome to the moment. Welcome to the leadership role. Um, and honored to be witnessing the seven of you embarking on this journey together. To those of you that are in the room, to those of you that are listening at home, 
part of um, creating conditions in which all of us can be the very best of who we are and the most authentic of all that we can be and to really honor and validate that spectacular uniqueness in each of us. I would encourage you to reflect on the same three questions because we're all in this journey together. The seven of them are leading us, but it is a journey that, we're, that they are committed to having us all go along. And so it's important at some point to simply say out loud, here is why, here's what I feel about the journey that we're about to go through as a community. Answer that question in your own mind. There's no follow-up, this is not homework. I just offer it as a suggestion. I would encourage you all to contemplate what contribution and commitment you're promising to the community through the process. And then finally, share a fun fact. Share a fun fact. It is gonna be serious work, and part of us is the multidimensionality of us. It's okay to laugh, it's okay to cry, it's okay to have any emotion between the two. And that's the kind of journey that's gonna allow us as a community to hang strong, to be clear, to arrive at a memorial that delivers on the promise that Commissioner Gibson laid out for us, that it is permanent, that it inspires, that it creates experience for people, right? So for all of you listening at home, I would encourage you to answer the same questions. If you're sitting by yourself, tell yourself, or look in the mirror and tell that really good-looking person that looks back at you. Or if you're sitting with someone else, have the conversation with them. Um, so that is now going to close out item number six on your agenda, committee members. Um, thank you for trusting yet again. It is not easy when you hear questions that you've never heard before um, and have to think on the spot, especially when you're for the first time in your life sitting in big old dais at the county commission chambers with cameras coming at you and lawyers and everyone sitting here looking at you. Um, I honor that uh, you just showed up. Because whatever it is that's in front of us and however complicated it may be, the superpower we have is to simply grant ourselves permission to just show up. And so for all of us, good reminder. For all of us at home, good reminder as well. And let's go together. Okay, opening up item number seven. The agenda item is select a chairperson and a vice chairperson. For those of you listening, um, we have had four workshops together. So the group has spent at least three to four hours four different times, July or June, July, August, and September. And so we have known, they have all been aware that today, the first public meeting, the first official action that they were gonna take was to self-select and declare their own leader. That would be the chair of the committee. And then also to self-select their own vice chair. We did not have discussion, we've not sort of, it just, they knew that it was gonna to happen today. They've had 16 hours to get to know each other, and sometimes we just know as we get familiar with people. So that's all I got in the way of background. What we need here, committee members, is a motion to, from one of you to suggest who you want as a chair and a vice chair, and then we will discuss it, take action, and then we will have leadership. So that's it, that's all I got. It is up to you to take it from here. I take the motion to nominate Tanil Pereira as the chair of the 1 October committee. Great, we've got a motion to nominate Tanil Pereira chair. She is giving me eye contact, so that's probably a good sign. Um, do we have a second for I'll that second motion? That. Dr. Fieldman seconded it. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Look how well we're doing, unanimous. <laughs> Congratulations, Madam Chair. Um, and now I'm gonna give you, you are now the chair. I have a folder that says chair. So this is coming to you if you think you're And then the second order of business is, do we have a motion for a vice chair? I'm gonna make a motion for a vice chair for uh, Caressa Royce. Great, motion, do we have a second? I'll second that. That was the motion made by Tanil Pereira, Chair Pereira, seconded by Minda Smith. The motion is Carissa Royce is vice chair. All those in favor indicate by saying aye, please. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Look at us go. Motion carries. Congratulations, Car Carissa Royce. So I would now turn it to Madam Chair. That would be Madam Pereira, Chair. If we had a gavel, I would hand it to you but I can't give you my pen because I need it. And so at this point, I will proudly and happily turn the meeting over to you. 
Thank you, Pinham. Um, I will open item, agenda item number eight um, to establish bylaws for the 1 October Memorial Committee. This is an action item. <clears throat> So for procedure, I would uh, motion for approval. Do we have a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Madam Chair, if I may, um, for the record, Plenum Mather, would it be helpful, the bylaws have not yet been posted publicly, so you've just approved something that no one's ever seen before. If helpful, can I give you just a thimbleful of overview um, so that the community knows exactly what the bylaws represent? Yes, absolutely, Poonam, thank you. Um, as you know, these bylaws were discussed in our previous workshops, um, but the public, I think, would benefit greatly from a discussion um, or ex explanation of those bylaws. Super, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, members of the committee and members of the public. Um, bylaws, just for uh, the sake of explanation, is they're really the organizational document that forms this committee. That's really what they are. So there's nothing in there that has to do with the permanent memorial. There's nothing in there about what it will be. It is simply the organizational document that gives birth to all of you. Well, not literally, but you know what I mean organizationally. Um, there are, it's five pages long, and so it will be now as an approved action. The bylaws will appear on the one Mem October Memorial website uh, later on today, I think, or tomorrow. Um, but here's in broad strokes what it does. It defines the committee's purpose, right? The here's why we exist. It describes the membership. There are seven appointed committee members. Remember that Governor Sisolak actually appointed Carissa Royce, Minda Smith, Tennille Perra, and Andrew Walsh, and the county commission separately appointed Rebecca, Harold, and Robert. Um, the bylaws also describe how the county commission will fill any vacancies that should arise if any of you are unable to participate, and the county commission is gonna be the sole place where those vacancies will be filled. Uh, it further goes on to describe sort of the process to elect a chair and a vice chair, which we just did, and then finally defines sort of the powers that you've got the duties and then gives you guidance on how you will conduct your open meetings. And so that's really in a nutshell what the bylaws are. They're just the organizational construct for this committee. Thank you, Poonam. With that, I will close agenda item number eight and we will move to agenda item number nine, <clears throat> which is the introduction and discussion of the mission. The mission is <clears throat> the 1 October Memorial Advisory Committee is a seven member group of citizens appointed to develop ideas and recommendations for a permanent 1 October Memorial that will remember those who perished in the events of 1 October 2017, honor the survivors and the many heroes who inspired the nation with their bravery and to celebrate the resiliency and compassion of our community. <clears throat> I seek a motion now to approve the mission. I make a motion to approve the mission. I second. It passes, or wait, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That closes agenda item number nine, <clears throat> and we'll move to agenda item number 10, the introduction and discussion of the goals. This is, again, an action item. The goals here <clears throat> were um, given to us by the commission, and uh, there are two of them. I will go ahead and read them. Um, to lead a process in which input and engagement for vict from victims, families, survivors, first responders, and community members will inform creation of a permanent one October memorial that will serve as a place to reflect on those lost and celebrate the unmatched strength of our community. <clears throat> Goal two is to recommend to the Board of County Commissioners plans for a site, design, programming, and ongoing maintenance needs for a permanent memorial, as well as funding solutions. So those are our two goals. 
I would <clears throat> look now for a motion. I will move for approval. I'll second. Passes. Or oh, all those in favor <laughs> say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes, and that will close agenda item number 10. <clears throat> and we will loop, move to open agenda item number 11. Um, a report on possible timeline. <clears throat> Poonam. Um, I would turn some time over to you if you could explain to us the phases um, for this project. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, for the record, my name is Puna Mather. The, um, you heard Commissioner Gibson um, describe that it was a decade from 9-11 to the ribbon cutting. And he sort of also said, but we can do it faster, right? <laughs> and so, Timeline, what we don't have is a timeline. If I define timeline as something that's very specific and has deadlines, we don't have that because we've just begun the journey. And so it made no sense to impose artificial timelines on a, on a journey that hasn't yet begun to reveal. Um, central to the goal and the mission, the, the goals and the mission that you just accepted and adapted is your absolute unwavering commitment to gain input to inform your thinking. And so really that's gonna guide the timeline, right? And so we're gonna be vigorous about it. What we did do, because for planning purposes, it's handy to have some framework in mind so that you're not thinking it's gonna take six months and I'm not thinking it's gonna take six years, but somewhere we've got a common arc or a common horizon along which we're sort of synchronized. And so that's the spirit with which I offer the timeline. So it's not really a timeline. What we did do is sort of flesh out in broad strokes phases. So the first phase we figured would take about six months and then there was this nasty deadly pandemic that kind of interfered with that a little bit. Um, and so, so be it. We, you were all appointed uh, about a year ago. It's been about a year, right? Since the appointments happened. Um, and then we went into some shutdown mode in the spring. You were courageous enough to pick up the work in June and we've had now the four workshops. So that six months has already been pushed back a few months. But phase one was contemplated as a phase in which we would have our workshops. You did four of them, check, check, and check. We were going to begin public meetings. Today's the first one. And we had also hoped that we would be gaining some community input, which we haven't yet accomplished in that first phase. So that's the first phase, originally slated for six months. We're at already 10 with not quite as much accomplished as we were hoping. Phase two, we expected, um, would be about identifying locations, talking about project scope, discussing what experience you wanted to deliver out of a memorial, those kinds of things. An awful lot of public input would go into that. So we thought that phase two was gonna take much longer. Um, and then finally, phase three is to then take all of the input, all of the ideas, and then commit them into a specific set of recommendations that is your obligation to present to the county commission to say here's what we as a community believe is what a, a permanent memorial should be. Here's where we think it should be. Here's what we believe it may cost and here's some recommendations on how to pay for it. So all of that we expected was gonna take um, a couple of years to go through those phases, three phases. And that takes us to groundbreaking, right? So when your work is done, what is delivered to the county commission is a plan, a set of recommendations. And then they would take action, and then that would tr trigger the, the beginning of the work. Um, so those are sort of the phases that we're contemplating. It is probably a couple of years of um, hard work out of all of you, characterized and defined by hopefully really energetic engagement by as many people in our community and world as we can possibly engage. So I probably answered with much more than you were hoping for, but there you have it. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you, Poonam. Um, I think this is a really important item. It's not an action item, but is there any discussion from the committee members on this, on the phases? No, I just want to say that um, studying a lot about memorials and about healing in communities with mass violence, that 
this process in and of itself is a healing process. And so the phases and how we honor um, the community, survivors, all those that are lost, our first responders, and all those that were impacted is really important. So um, it's been very uh, thought out and contemplated, and um, so thank you for that. So I will close item number 11, and we will move to item 12 on the agenda. Um, this is going to be a discussion um, led by Poonam regarding expectations and commitments of the committee. Poonam. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Poonam Mather. I'm getting tired of hearing my own voice, so I hope that there's a lot of discussion here. <laughs> um, expectations and commitments of the community. So I would say to the members of the public, um, as we went through the 16 hours, as they went through their 16 hours of workshops together, we had a lot of sharing. We shared a lot uh, of, we were, they were really brave with their vulnerability. They were really revealing in the dimensions that they were willing to expose and share with each other. And as they went through that process, what sort of emerged, Oh, thank you. What um, emerged were what you see on the screen, expectations and commitments. So here's what didn't happen. They didn't say, here's what I expect of you and here's what I commit to you. Instead, they really got to know each other and express what their own needs were and this is what revealed as what was true for all of them, right? Um, and so I think this is a really authentic reflection of the expectations that the seven of you have and the commitments that you are also all willing to be accountable to keep, um, which I think makes it a cooler list than if we just said, here's seven that we you know, stole from somewhere else and you should apply them. So you can see what they are. Um, they have a lot of depth in conversation that isn't evident so much when you see them committed on a single sheet of paper. But um, let me just go through them. We respect and honor. Both of those are non-negotiable. Um, each other, the purity of every other person's intention. And that was something that they talked about even as it, as, as it extended. You heard several of them. I look at Carissa who said, I'm gonna be really present. I'm gonna listen really hard. I wanna be open-hearted and open-minded. All of that is captured in that one little phrase. Um, so they respect and honor each other. They respect and honor the purity of each other's intention and by extension the community's intention. The unique gifts expertise and perspective that every single person is gonna participate and bring. Um, so that is a pinky promise that they have made to one another um, and they are gonna be accountable to one another for keeping it and I think by extension, it gives us all as members of the community an opportunity to make the same pinky promises, just put our pinky in there and promise that we'll show up in that way as well. Uh, they have committed and they expect of each other to be on time, to show up, suit up, be ready. Um, be present and participate actively. And again, we would, I think they would ask, stop me if I'm wrong, but I think they would want the community to please be present, please participate, please be a part of it. Third, they will maintain an open mind and open heart and be unwaveringly compassion. Um, this was a big deal. We actually had uh, a two hour session where the Vegas Strong Resiliency Center came in and helped us. We're all, what we're looking at are seven citizens called and who have responded to serve in this moment in a really complicated, um, significantly important effort. And so they spent time building the skills and the confidence to operate with compassion, to understand what it meant to be empathetic. Um, and so we had the Resiliency Center come in and do some training, which was really fabulous. And that was so that they could then deliver on this commitment, right? We, will maintain an open mind, an open heart, be unwaveringly compassionate. And then finally, when you are leaders, they also agree that it's important to get something done. And so their final commitment to one another was we're gonna achieve our mission and our goals. The county commission believes in us. The governor believed in us. The community believes in us. We are chosen for this moment, we are here. And so let's just deliver. And so those are uh, a little bit of sort of color in terms of what gave rise to these expectations and commitments. And uh, at some point, you're looking for a motion to uh, approve them or some additional conversation to fill in the parts I missed. Thank you, Poonam. Um, I would just add <clears throat> on, you know, the respecting, honoring, 
um, each other, the purity of each member's intentions. This could be, or this will be a very emotional uh, process, and there are a lot of emotions involved. Um, and, you know, we felt that it was really important to um, honor the purity of the intentions, that we're all coming from a good place. Um, I just wanted to highlight that. Is there any discussion on this from members of the committee? Hi, everyone. Um, I also just want to, to note and highlight that all of us collectively as a community, as a committee, we are walking through and navigating uncharted territory. And this will be challenging um, personal um, healing for so many of us. Um, and I thank each of you for, for taking the call to action to walk through this. And I want to thank the community in advance um, for your grace and understanding and participation and willingness to participate in this process with us. Thank you, Caressa. Anyone else? With that, I will seek a motion for approval. A motion to approve. I second that motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. And we will close item, agenda item number 12 and move on to agenda item number 13. Um, this is a discussion for future topics for agenda items for the next uh, couple meetings. So for our November and December monthly meetings, uh, we need to put some things on the agenda. So a couple thoughts or ideas. Um, I would propose pos possibly bringing in the Vegas Strong Resiliency Center to um, do some training, a presentation. <clears throat> uh, we have uh, so many different perspectives, so many different um, positions of, of those impacted in the community. I think that it would be a good introduction to have some training on some of those perspectives um, just for a better understanding of one another and how um, different people might see um, this memorial. So I think that's one item. Um, open for other ideas. Harold Bratt was speaking. I was thinking another thing just came to my mind. Uh, maybe uh, is it too early to start thinking of, of ways uh, about the financing and fundraising and that type of thing? Um, I know it's it's going to be we, we're expecting a couple of years or more, but at the same time, I think uh, it's never too soon to think about uh, ways that uh, we, we may be able to fund the whole project. Thank you. I have one, uh, Tanil. I would like to add, and that is, I I would hope that we can have some active involvement from the audience, uh, from those that are representing the public that, you know, in being here. Um, because as you indicated, we're certainly going into uh, untested waters. I don't think any of us have been through this before. And we're going to need a lot of assistance <clears throat> and a lot of uh, insight from, uh, from those of you and the public who are here today and uh, I, I hope we can have a segment on, uh, on the agenda of each um, meeting so that we can hear from you and uh, receive comments and thoughts and ideas about how we can uh, start pulling this thing together because right now it's this wide and our job is going to be to narrow it and bring it closer and closer and and then have a path to completion. And we really look forward to that challenge, uh, but we need your assistance in order to help us get there. Thank you, Dr. Fielding. Um, on that note, it might be a good idea to get some data or information um, on uh, surveys. So a possible survey company that can 
provide surveys that we can send out to the community to gather as much input um, as possible, I think would be a good um, thing to add. There was one more that I was thinking of and I lost my thought. Madam um, Chairman, <clears throat> that's fun to say, just so you know. Um, I would like, if you could, just to address what community consists of, because we've said it in a lot of verbiage and I think it would be good to just express verbally what we consider to be community. That's a good point, Minda, thank you. So the community is essentially um, all those impacted by One October. So the community is not necessarily a ge geographical limit, because as you know, we had thousands of people um, here from out of town. Um, and I've even spoken to people that were just so shocked um, by what happened, watching the news over and over and over, and they felt greatly impacted. So it's all those that are impacted. So we have you know, our families that have lost loved ones, we have survivors that were injured and continue to survive and, and uh, heal, and we have um, those in our geographical community, you know, Las Vegas was impacted greatly, um, but our first responders, um, our medical first responders, our people on the phones that were taking calls, and then, of course, always our heroes that went um, running in um, corners, such a big community. Um, so it is all those impacted by uh, 1 October. Thank you. I think it would be um, important to note, um, I think having a presentation by the Resiliency Center would be helpful. Um, building on what you had mentioned, Minda, while we all have our own processing of the magnitude of this event, I think to have the Vegas Strong Resiliency Center prov provide some of that data for us um, and really make it clear what that magnitude and how far and wide um, this community really is. It spans several countries, several states, um, many demographics of human beings, and I think that's important in this process um, prior to beginning to making um, any further decisions. So thank you both for that. Thank you, Caressa. And then I would add one more thing um, to help us move forward to kind of set this foundation for this um, project is uh, engaging some experts of um, other memorials um, that would kind of fit into this mass violence uh, memorial type category. So I think, you know, that might be a little bit more down the road than like the um, Vegas Strong Resiliency Center um, presentations, but I think that's something that will help us kind of um, build that foundation. Is there any other discussion on possible agenda items for our next two or three meetings? Uh, one of the uh, things that I, I personally found most interesting about uh, our earlier workshops is uh, also the, um, the collection that has been developed by Clark County Museum. And I think that that's something that uh, would benefit the public. And if we had, uh, could get uh, the folks from the museum to come and uh, make a presentation uh, as they did to our workshop, I think that would be exceptionally helpful. Thank you, Dr. Fielding. Any other comment on this? In addition to the collections, I think um, it's important to um, understand and perhaps have folks from um, the other memorial-like um, places um, let us know what cur currently exists. Um, there is a garden. There are a few other memorial spots that currently exist in our community and beyond. And I think it's important um, to see what, what has been created so far and what we can build on. Thank you, Caressa. Any other discussion? Nope. With that, I will close um, agenda item 13, and we will open agenda item 14. 
This is comments um, by the general public. It's a period devoted to comments by the general public about matters relevant to the public body's jurisdiction. Um, no, va no vote may be taken on a matter not listed on the posted agenda. <clears throat> comments will be limited to three minutes. Um, I would ask anyone that is here um, to make a comment to please step up to the podium. Clearly state your name and address. Please spell your last name for the record. Good morning, everybody. I am Gail Shomish. I am the co-owner of All Fired Up, Paint Your Own Pottery here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Our studio address is 1651 East Sunset Road, Suite A103, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89119. Our studio's website is allfiredupLV.com. Um, this is a really emotional topic for me I did not lose somebody personally in the October 1st event. However, my studio facilitated all of the public art paintings of ceramic tiles that became installed in the Healing Garden downtown. If anyone has been in my orbit in the last three years, my focus is to continually make it aware to as many committees and or organizations as possible that there are still hundreds and hundreds of tiles still in storage in what was the basement of Get Outdoors Nevada, which now I understand they have now moved locations to Pecos and Charleston, away from the um, church building they used to have their offices within. And it came to my attention very recently that the Healing Garden, which is really quite a little jewel for our city. When you think about New York and 9-11 and the fact that thousands of lives were lost and it took 10 years for them to get a monument, of course, a spectacular scale compared to what we are looking at here in our city. However, um, within a week, the grassroots efforts got that plot of land downtown on Casino Center in Charleston bulldozed, built, a makeshift garden was built, and the first night on, um, the first Friday, we must have had 1,500 people paint tiles on the driveways, the blacktop, the sidewalks, the makeshift tables that were donated with chairs for people to sit and paint at. It, the, the lighting company, came to retrieve tables and chairs at the end of their contracted time. They took the lights away and we, people refused to give up. They wanted to honor their loved ones. They wanted to have that cathartic experience that art can help people express things they cannot say. Um, we didn't leave till about one or two in the morning. Um, my studio processed art for probably a good couple of months getting all the firings done. We hosted um, additional um, public painting events at Doral Pebble Academy. Um, that was for the general public. I partnered with Shelley Berkeley Elementary to host a painting evening for first responders, the medical community. Um, the second half of that night, we also opened it up for further uh, general public to participate. Um, oh. Is that already three minutes? Good Lord. I am I'm such a left-brained artist. <laughs> um, is there a possibility for me to continue with time? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll start to wrap. Um, at any rate, um, whether moving forward, additional tile art created by the public becomes part of this picture or not, that's not my main focus, but I did want to bring up this concept that might marry into some of the thought processes. 
Um, I'm currently about to start to consult with a studio similar to mine in Florida on the Stoneman Douglas um, high school shootings. We're gonna be facilitating a tile painting community project there for a memorial wall being installed at that. Not the high school, they're gonna raise that high school, they're gonna build a new one. Um, Public art participation for something like this can be a very good community builder. Um, yes, it's emotional for people. Um, there are sometimes um, instances where people cannot speak, they are visibly crying, they are shaken. Uh, whatever the status is for each person, it's a very individual experience. We partner with local elementary schools all throughout the year on fundraisers for this type of work. It's not for memorial work, for losing a loved one. However, quite a few of the schools that I work with partner with us for significant anniversaries, like a, a 10 year anniversary of the school, um, 15 year, 25 year, that sort of thing. Our, our city's got some age on it now and some of these elementary schools have been in existence for quite a while. So it is very common for the public to pay for money to have their tile put on just a simple elementary school. Um, generally, there's a $25 or more margin, sometimes $50 and $100 per piece are common. So a um, fundraising effort in that way to have the public be able to participate on tile art, whether it gets installed in this memorial that we're speaking of or not, maybe a different location, maybe it gets added to the healing garden, whatever the case, um, there is fundraising opportunities in that realm and community building um, public awareness to be participatory in this type of project, I think there's a really good um, touchstone that can be built upon with that. Um, my business partner is Jackie Burrow. She's not available to be here today. She's not feeling well, but um, we welcome anyone to contact our studio. Um, our phone number is 702-269-4444. We are happy to freely consult and share ideas and give any insight on any of this type of thing. And of course, you can see the work that we've been doing um, at the Healing Garden downtown. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Any further public comment? I'd like to say good morning and thank you for all the time that you've given. And my name is Debbie Davis, D-A-V-I-S, and my husband Chris is here as well. And I really wanna thank all of you for the time that you've spent so far, 16 hours, plus the many hours ahead that you will spend doing this. I also want to thank you for the time to represent my feelings regarding changing the 58 to the 60. 58 is the name or the symbol of the worst mass shooting in the history of our country. And I personally want to see compassion and kindness for all those that suffered on the night of 1 October, not just the 58 individuals, but also their families, the injured, the first responders, and our city. As far as the official statistics are concerned, the number of deceased may change in the future due to the injuries that were suffered that night. My, ha my heart goes out to them and their families, as I'm certain their suffering is terrible. Having said that, the 58 stands alone as an identifiable symbol of the tragedy itself. It does represent those that were killed on that night, but it also represents those that were injured, the first responders, and all those who helped so selfishly, selflessly, excuse me. I forgot, I can't, <laughs> I can't talk or breathe. It also represents the survivors who have been so dedicated to support the 58 and all that it means. For the families of the 58 killed, we had no answered prayers to change the outcome, no hope of recovery, no last minute guidelines for how to handle their family and business affairs, and no last goodbyes. Most certainly the two families 
with the delayed deceased should be remembered. In future ceremonies and memorials, it's the right thing to do to acknowledge any of those people that have passed since 1 October. I would suggest there be a plaque or something at the healing garden with any names of delayed deaths due to the event of 1 October to honor them and to show our deep respect. In the days that have passed since the third anniversary, I have become aware that I'm not the only one feeling this way. We have a private Facebook page with the other 50 sam 57 families, and not one has disagreed. We have also spoken with many of the survivors, excuse me, We've also spoken with many of the survivors and none of them disagree either. We all ask that the 58 stand as not just a number, but a never changing symbol that represents the immediate losses, including, inclusive of those injured and the senselessness of one man's devious action. It is the history of the night, but far more. 58 has great meaning in our city and our country. We stand united in our request. On behalf of the 58 families and many others, I respectfully ask for your support of the sim symbol staying 58. And I thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. That's my girl. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Chris Davis, uh, D-A-V-I-S. Uh, we live in Summerlin, and um, I lost my daughter on October 1, Nisha Tonks. Um, but I also have an angel on earth here. Minda Smith is my, my angel on earth. So. Um, you know, I, as, and, I, and I appreciate, Doctor, your, your comments. A couple of agenda items I'm going to suggest because I don't know what I don't know. But, you know, a couple of things that I would suggest is, is where are we going to do this and what's it going to look like? Um, as, as I've met with uh, Governor Sisolak and some, some folks about this, we don't know what, what it's going to look like. But I, that's going to be a, a big task to, to understand what that memorial is going to look like. So I would suggest that. You get that on your agenda because you're going to need the artist uh, input. You're going to need a lot of input of what it's going to look like and where it's going to be. So I would suggest that, that we get on that, and, and I'd be happy to help, but Minda's good. <laughs> In your mission statement, you also state that you want to honor those who perished that night. So as you, as you can see, our passion for the 58 you actually said that in your mission statement about the people who perished that night. So to, to me, you need to honor that 58. Um, it means a lot. When, when Nisha died, um, she was a single mom of three boys, and Debbie and I became instant grandparents, and I have three sons that, that we're actually raising at this moment. To, to get one of those children into college because Grace uh, Braxton was a senior in, in high school, it was very difficult. I hadn't done that for a while. And to get him in college was, was a process. And as, as Minda and Debbie and I would walk every morning and talk because it was, we needed each other so badly, we, we said, let's start a scholarship for the children of the 58. If we're struggling with it, I gotta believe that the other 57 families are struggling with it as well. So we started a scholarship for the children of the 58, and we actually have children who are right now participating with that scholarship money to further their education. So the 58 is very precious to us. It's, it's a symbol that we think needs to stay there. As Debbie stated, our hearts are, are very full and go out to those who have perished. Um, since that time, but as you stated, those have perished on that night. There are 58 angels in heaven that we need to always remember those people. So thank you. I, I appreciate all the work you all are doing. 
Um, I can't thank you enough. I know the time is precious, especially now. And um, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for your comments. Do we have any other further pub? Yep. Good morning. My name is Albert Rivera, the father of Jordan Rivera. I live in Laverne, California. My last name is R I V E R A. Um, Really thank you guys for doing this. I got to speak at the Sunrise service this past October 1st. And uh, the attendance that we had there um, during COVID really touched my heart. Um, people that were viewing um, from their homes just to support us. Um, this kind of reminds me of that. Um, you guys have many other things you can be doing, but showing that how important this is um, really touches my heart and my family's heart and the 57. Um, you know, I've been to the 9-11 Memorial. I've been to Pearl Harbor Memorial. And my heart went out to those families. Never did I think we would have our home memorial. And um, it, it's home. As a symbol of the 58, though, I'm, when I gave my speech that morning on October 1st, I was kind of taken back. I was on a high. Um, don't really remember what I said that morning, <laughs> but I was on a high when uh, I was done, and we celebrated them, we honored them, and then the last sentence of that closing ceremony was going forward, we will now, what I heard was, We're going to forget the 58 and go to 60. I ask you guys to help us keep the 58 intact for everything it represents of everyone, what everyone just said. We honor everyone that's going to die from this. There's going to be more. And um, that's unfortunate. But every year, I agree with Debbie every memorial service every year, whoever has passed from this, we acknowledge them there. And they should be acknowledged. Um, so I just ask for your support. I just ask that you would go before us, be our mouthpiece, if you can. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Sue Ann Cornwell, and um, first I'll start with thanking you all for being here and taking on this important position that you're in. Um, I wouldn't want it, <laughs> so I thank you guys for being in the hot seats, per se. Um, I'm a survivor from, from the shooting, and um, um, I'm here to also stand up for the 58 families and the number and, and what it means to our fan, the our angels, and and us as survivors. Um, I had one of the 58 angels pass away in my truck that night as I tried to get her to the hospital. So it's the number 58 just means so much. So I'm just going to try to read what I have here and um, try not to make me to cry too much. So um, okay, so uh, my name is Sue Ann Cornwell. And I'm here to explain why the number 58 should stand alone as a symbol that represents one tragic night that changed so many lives. I'm here today to tell you what the number 58 represents and means to myself and thousands of others. The number 58 
stands for the senseless act of Route 91 on October 1, 2017, and the immediate losses of that night. The number 58 stands for our 58 angels that never went home. The 58 families whose lives were changed forever on October 1, 2017. The 58 that never said goodbye. The 58 that never hugged again. The 58 that never, never celebrated another birthday. The 58 that never had survivor behind their name. The 58 that never had another conversation with a loved one. For survivors like myself, the number 58 means love and kindness. The number 58 means compassion and healing. The number 58 means family and support. The number 58, our 58 angels, are with us in our hard times and our good times. The number 58 means our angels are watching over us survivors. <clears throat> the number 58 re represents those lives lost that night, and the 58 represents those that were injured that night. The 58 represents those concert goers that stayed and helped, that didn't run, and helped carry our injured out and get them to help. It represents <clears throat> the first responders. The 58 represents the children of the 58 Foundation. It represents Honor 58, who represents each of our angels by doing random acts of kindness throughout the year, and most importantly, in October, when <clears throat> just by leaving an extra tip or a $58 tip or giving somebody $58 or handing out 58 flowers, however people choose to do that. Uh, the organization Love Wins was created by a photographer that was at Route 91 and does a tremendous job in representing our 58. <clears throat> um, there have been songs written like 58 Angels, 58 Stars, and Vegas Strong, and we are all Vegas Strong today because of our 58. The 58 stands for the survivors who are dedicated to support the 58 families. The 58 is represented in tattoos of many survivors. The 58 are represented on our shirts. The 58 are represented on our hats. And the 58 are represented on our stickers on our cars because they are our guiding light. I know of several folks that have passed that were survivors of Route 91 from car wrecks, from motorcycle wrecks, and several from taking their own lives, from sisters, brothers, friends, and girlfriends. It has been said that the number 58 should be changed to 60. I ask this, why 60? A number that means, <clears throat> that has no meaning to so many. What about the 11 that took their lives shortly afterwards? Is this not a result of that tragic night? Is mental illness not counted? How does anyone change the number 58 without disrespecting the families of the 58 who were lost that night? Like the RJ did in an article on the three-year uh, remembrance. And I forgot it. Can I grab it real quick? Let me just grab it. So this article shows our 58 angels from that night, and part of them are covered up by a 60. And then the two that want to be included, that people think should be included in our number, are represented in larger pictures. And to me, when I saw this, I was instantly angered by the fact that they disrespected the 58 families of our 58 angels. Um, sorry, uh, I gotta find my spot. Um, also, at the <clears throat> one October remembrance um, this year, 
um, like was mentioned before, um, it was mentioned that the number was going to be changed to 60. That was a total disrespect to our 58 families that were represented there. Not all were there because of the COVID thing, but the ones that were there felt like they just got punched in the gut because that's what that number means to them. That, not, that number represents their loved ones. So I talked to the person that runs the 9-11 Memorial in New York. Their original number never changes. They've had several firefighters pass away from lung problems <clears throat> because of um, diseases they have gotten from working at, at um, Ground Zero. They're not added to that number. <clears throat> the Pulse that's working on their memorial right now, they have, they have their original number and I've been told by the people organizing that 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 number's not going to change. <clears throat> that they're going to have figure out another way to represent the survivors that have passed since then. So, as a survivor, any follow any fellow survivor that passes and or has passed <clears throat> breaks our heart. We are a family. We become a family, and it's not a family that anybody wants to be a part of but here we are, you know. Um, <clears throat> so the, the problem with changing the number is that anybody that has passed afterwards that had the privilege to be a survivor after, have a survivor pass their name, they've had the privilege to tell somebody they love them, to get a hug, to have a conversation, to celebrate holidays. Our 58 didn't have that chance. So... I know for myself, I will always stand for 58, and I will follow them, and I will fight for them at any time that I need to be need to stand for them. So, um, and then I'm I'm gonna just touch on the healing garden for just a minute. The healing garden has 58 trees, 58 stars on one of the walls that represents our 58, 58 brass names. 58 pictures of the 58 that were lost that evening. On the dedication day of the remodel of the garden, one year, as our mayor was speaking of the garden, our 58 angels, we all, all the survivors looked up in the air, and this is what we saw. And the whispers of the survivors that were there each and every one of us believed in our heart of hearts that was, this was our 58 making their final journey to heaven and letting us know that we are doing a good job representing them and honoring their memory. So we believe the heavens opened up for them that day. So <clears throat> the Healing Garden Committee has voted to not add trees or individual markings in the healing garden for any of the survivors that have passed. On that note, we have been working on a project that will allow any families of survivors that have passed to put their loved ones' names on it. This will be represented, this will be representing our Route 91 families' love for our survivors that have passed, the loss that we all feel each and every time a survivor passes. I encourage you all, if you haven't been to the Healing Garden, please do. It truly has become what it is meant to be, a place of healing. It may help you understand the families of our 58s and the survivors' view. The 58 is much more than a number. 58 is a symbol. It's a symbol of love and respect, and it's a symbol of how a survivors survive each and every day, knowing that our 58 got our back. And again, thank you all for what you do. I appreciate it. Thank you for your comments. Do we have any further public comment? No, with that, I will close agenda item. Janelle, number. Be, 
sorry, Tennille, before you do that, or Madam Chair, uh, I just wanted to point out to the committee that uh, there were public comments that were submitted as of before yesterday at 3 p.m. Those are in your backup materials. And, um, and please take a look. Uh, you'll see it's behind your bylaws. And so the first portion of that is kind of statements that we've been sending out on verbiage of, uh, so on the premise of 58 or the verbiage, uh, depending on what person is asking. And then also you did have some comments about location as well. And so to give you a synopsis, um, emails about the location of the memorial. Uh, we had three emails about, um, about parking lot location and one email about the meeting location. So that's in your backup. Then you'll see all those emails. Uh, and then your, your next set of emails is gonna be that we had emails about keeping the number of 58 for the memorial. We had 13 emails about keeping the number 50, 58. And then those are all listed for you as well. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out, Mickey. And we will review um, all of these uh, emails and comments um, that were received, so thank you. And with that, I will close item, agenda item number 14, and open uh, agenda item number 15, um, our future meeting schedule. Our future meeting schedule is uh, the fourth Wednesday of each month, beginning at 9 a.m. Um, the next meeting will be November 25th, 2020, and then the following meeting is scheduled to be December 23rd, 2020. Um, are we going to have, given that these are very close to holidays, um, I would like to see with the other committee members if they have, um, if they're scheduled to not be available uh, for November 25th, 2020. Is there anyone not going to be available? I, I will not be at the meeting in November. Thank you, Minda. So Minda will not be available. Anyone else? No. Okay. So I think that we will still be fine. We'll still have quorum. So we can hold, uh, keep that meeting on the 25th. And then the following meeting, December 23rd, are we going to have any committee members out um, unavailable for that meeting? I will be un unavailable December 23rd. Anyone else? No. So we should still be fine then for um, the December 23rd meeting as well. And with that, I will close. Before we adjourn the meeting, is there a way to backtrack a little bit and, and just give a little bit of an insight to the process? I think that there's maybe some miscommunication I don't even think it's miscommunication, it's misunderstanding of how this process is going to work. Um, with us, you know, not necessarily being the ones who are deciding, you know, where, when, um, how big, how small. Is there a way that we could just go back real fast and talk about the process of this, um, you know, choosing a memorial and how, how that's going to come about? So I believe that there is. Would we need to open one of the agenda items? You, you, I would recommend that rather than do that, you put that on your next agenda to discuss okay. that. Then everyone will be noticed on it. Okay, great. Good, thank you. So we will put that on our next agenda item, um, probably open with that. That would probably make the most sense. So thank you, Minda. Yeah. And then additionally, Item number 15 is actually a, uh, an action item, so you do have to make a motion. I'd so move. I second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
No. Okay, so that is passes. So we will meet November 25th and December 23rd. And I will close agenda item number 15. Um, with that brings us to agenda item number 16, which is adjournment. Um, do I have a motion? Motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? I'll second. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.